Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and to see some familiar faces and some new faces in the crowd. Um, so, you know, as Sarah was saying, I, um, you know, I did my PhD in UC Santa Cruz, so all my work has been kind of split between temperate systems and tropical systems. And today I'm going to talk a lot about the work that I did in, in East Africa, in Kenya, um, and then sort of transition into some of the newer work that I'm doing right now in the California coastline, but it's still preliminary, so I don't have as, quite as many results for that work. So to just give you a little bit of an outline of my talk, for those of you who aren't um, algae fanatics, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about crestose coral and algae and why we might care and what the heck it is. Um, do a really quick introduction to species interactions and indirect effects that happen through trophic cascades. And then move into talking about research on um, fishing and coral in abundance, how fishing affects coral and species composition and ultimately coral recruitment. And then the work that I'm doing right now, looking at coralline ocean acidification dynamics and invertebrate settlement in California. So what are the coral and algae? Well, they also secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton. And there are two types. This is probably most of you guys know this, but I just need to make sure everybody's on the same page. There are geniculate coralline. And so those um, tend to be branching coralline. They have little spaces in them which don't have the skeleton that allow them to be flexible. Then there are the non-geniculate, which can be branching, like rotoliths, or crestose, so coating the bottom of the ocean. And I'm going to focus today on the crestose variety. Um, and I just have to give you guys a heads up that in my talk, I often abbreviate it as CCA, crestose coral and algae. And so I'm talking about the, the crusting kind that's kind of like the bubble gum that you see all along the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so the distribution of the crustose coralline on my very sophisticated map, you can pretty much see that it's everywhere. And so to me, what this really means is that the world is really one big coralline. Um, it's, it's widespread in all the world's oceans. It's found in intertidal and subtidal habitats. And in some areas, it covers close to 100% of the rocky substrate. So you would think we know an awful lot about it. Answer, no. And so this is an incredibly common organism type that's really important for a lot of ecological dynamics. And in fact, very little of its ecology has been studied. Um, and so what is its importance? Well, there's two really main roles that it plays. One is that it can contribute significantly to reef calcification. So this is actually a picture of a reef in Midway Atoll that is primarily built of crestose coral and algae. And you get that a lot um, in, the, um, in parts of the Pacific. But then the part that I'm studying about is that um, a lot of species of coralline can induce larval settlement of benthic invertebrates. And so they actually release a chemical cue that larvae can sense. And larvae tend to be more likely to settle when they find that cue and they'll settle on this, the species of coralline that release that, um, that chemical cue. And so that's incredibly important ecologically. And the problem comes in when is that, that humans can indirectly affect both the type and the amount of corallins and then start changing these cues that invertebrate larvae are sensing. And so people, um, the wider community may not care so much about corallin, but their heads might come up if you start talking about loss of corals or fish species like abalone and urchins. So just a very, very quick um, introduction to what I'm going to be talking about with species interactions and some of the indirect effects of things like fishing. If you look at a really basic food web, you would have a top carnivore, which consumes an herbivore, has a negative effect on that. The herbivore, in turn, is going to have a negative effect on the plant. And so the dotted line is indicating that the carnivore has this indirect negative, or sorry, positive effect on the plant mediated by the herbivore. And so if we looked at a very simplified example, you could have some carnivorous spiders that were preying on some herbivorous grasshoppers, which really should have six legs. I apologize for any insect people out there. Um, and you know the grasshoppers would be consuming the, the grass or meadow community. If we came in as humans and fumigated some of the carnivores, you could imagine that you'd end up with a lot of herbivores and the herbivores might consume the plant community. But that is actually very, very simplistic and rarely happens. And so more likely what happens is that there are multiple things down at the base level of the food chain that are actually interacting amongst each other. And so if we have this central plant that I've depicted, it may have a positive relationship with species A, which really could be anything. It could be another plant. Um, that gets some benefit from this central plant. It could be an animal that's eating that plant, but whatever the case is, that when this plant is present, you have a lot of species A. And then you could have another species over here, species 
B, which is a competitor um, with the plant. And so when you have a lot of plant, you have very little of species B. And so because you have all these base level interactions going on, these ecosystem level effects are really never quite so simple. And so the carnivore is actually having effects on all of the things at the base of the food web. And so when you remove a carnivore and you get a lot of herbivore, what you often get is simply a shift in the benthic community. And so not just a more or less, but actually a very, very different. And that is what I spent a lot of time looking at during my PhD. Um, and just to wrap up the grasshopper spiders, I didn't come out, out with that in my, um, my own imagination, although it is a delightful animation. Um, <laughs> it came out of a paper where they looked at this. And in fact, the meadow community shifted from domination by one type of plant species to domination by another type of plant species. OK, so moving into the bulk of my research. Um, so one thing I became very interested in as a PhD student was looking at the effects of fishing on coral in abundance. Um, and so I was doing this in, in Kenya, East Africa, which might at first seem like an odd place to run off and look at corallins. But the reason I became very interested in this is that a collaborator of mine with Wildlife Conservation Society, Tim McClanahan, had a really large data set showing some unusual patterns that we really couldn't explain that related to fishing and coral and algae, the Crestos variety of coral. And so, you know, in Kenya, there are tropical reefs built by corals. And there is also coral and algae. And from a lot of literature and mainly laboratory studies, we know that, um, that coral and algae, some species, can have um, this chemical that, is, that induces coral larvae to settle out. Some coral larvae respond quite strongly to this and prefer not to settle at all if they don't find the right coral and substrate. <coughs> and then we know that there's a lot of fishing going on. And Tim McClanahan's data set was indicating that removal of these fish was having some kind of an indirect effect on the corallin so that we were getting dramatic, dr sorry, dramatic reductions of corallin in fished reefs compared to marine protected reefs. And so I asked three basic questions. How in this system was corallin abundance affected by fishing? Was it just a more or less phenomenon or was it actually a species composition shift amongst the corallin? And then based on both of these changes, did we see a response in coral recruitment? And so if you think about sort of who are the players in the type, this type of ecosystem that, that I was looking at, so we have the predators, which could be like predatory fish. We have some herbivores, which could be sea urchins or herbivorous fish. The herbivores are going to be primarily consuming um, fleshy macroalgae, which outcompetes corallin. So this is a really important part of the dynamic is that fleshy macroalgae is a fast grower and it can outcompete corallin for space and light. So it has a negative impact on corallin. And then we think that corallin should have a positive impact on things like corals. I want to also just quickly point out that these herbivores could also have impacts through their grazing activities on these other things, but I'm not going to be focusing on that right now. OK, so if you look in temperate systems, so like the California kelp forest, and so not in the tropics, we're going to take a step back to the temperate systems, because I have to talk about sort of what, what I knew going into this study. Um, and so in temperate systems in California, for example, we have fish, we have some other, um, some other large predators like sea otters. We have actually few or no, no herbivorous fish in this hemisphere. Um, so we primarily have the sea urchin, which, is, which can consume the fleshy algae. And then the fleshy algae is having this competitive interaction with corallin. And so in this system, the sea urchin is actually having an indirect positive impact on the corallin. And, if, and so the predator is having an indirect negative impact. If you were to remove a lot of the predators, you end up with a lot of sea urchins very little fleshy algae, and a, and a lot of coralline. And so this is what we traditionally call coralline barren. So these are these habitats in kelp forests where the kelp is basically removed. You have a lot of sea urchins and a lot of coralline. OK, so in my mind, it was always linked. Sea urchin equals lots and lots of coralline. OK. Um, and so um, if you look at marine protected areas, in temperate areas and protected areas, you actually have a decrease of coralline. And it's not just that you're not measuring it as much because it's covered by the algae. It actually does go down in percent cover. And in fish areas, because of all the grazing of the fleshy macroalgae, you end up with an increase in coralline cover. And so this is sort of a, a this is the basic schematic I just showed you with a, a hypothetical graph of what that looks like. And when you move to a different system like the Caribbean, where there's also been a lot of work done, 
Um, what you don't have in the, in the modern day Caribbean are sea urchins because they died from a devastating disease in the 1980s. And so you have your predatory fish, you've got herbivorous fish. The herbivorous fish are removing the fleshy algae and because of that the herbivorous fish are having a positive effect on the coralline. But MPAs are protecting both fish types and because fishing is so intense what you see is the opposite pattern is that in the Caribbean you get a much higher cover of crested coral and algae within protected areas than without. And so moving into the Kenyan system, we have predatory fish, we have herbivorous fish, we also have a lot of sea urchins, in fact nine different species of sea urchins. And they're relatively abundant. And, you know, and then we've got this same dynamic of competition between fleshy algae and crustose coral and algae. So within protected areas, we have a lot of fish. They are consuming the fleshy algae. Within fished areas, we have a lot of sea urchins because we take out the predatory fishes. And the sea urchins are consuming a lot of fleshy algae. So my expectation would be that you would actually see even cover of, um, of coralline between protected and fished areas and not so. Um, so basically, I'm just going to skip this, which is pointing out that this is the area where we're seeing changes across these systems. But if you look at the Kenyan system, what you find is that in the protected areas, there is very high cover of coralline, and in the fished areas, it, it actually almost virtually it drops out of the system altogether. And so that was in contrast to the expectations that were set up by these two previous regions where we had more information. So just to give you a little bit of background about the steady locations in Kenya, Kenya is on the coast of East Africa. Um, it's, um, it has its coastline on the western Indian Ocean. The orange line here is a fringing reef, so there's a very long fringing reef system that goes about halfway up through the country. Luckily not quite close to Somalia, which I tend to avoid due to piracy. Um, although I have to say one thing for the pirates, as piracy has been increasing, actually the sport fishing boats that go outside the fringing reef and fish more out here are getting bigger and bigger catches because nobody, the commercial guys aren't willing to go fish there, so go pirates. Um, <laughs> okay, but more realistically, my work actually took place in this very nice, safe back reef lagoon right along the coast of Kenya. And Kenya is kind of unique in the developing world because it has very, very long-term marine protected areas that were put in place a long time ago. So in the late 1960s, there were three marine protected areas that were put in, and then a little bit later in 1990, there was this one in the, um, the coastal capital city of Mombasa that was put in. And so I did work in, um, in three of these protected areas and then in four um, fish sites that were um, spread out amongst them. And so, so, I'm sorry, that's outdated. This is actually not impressed. That, this, this work was now published in Ecology in 2010. Um, but if you look at the percent coral and cover, what you see is that at the long-term protected sites, so sites that have been protected at this, at this point in time, it had been about 20 years, you have a little above 20% cover. At the fish sites, you have less than 5%, and so it gets very low. And the transition site is that protected area that was put in later, the Mombasa Marine Protected Area, and so it's kind of in between, and it looks like there's this sort of recovery trajectory that's happening. And 20, 20, 20 plus percent of coralline is very high. Coral cover in Kenya is about 25 percent. This is a really dominant player in the benthic ecosystem. Okay, so what I wanted to do going into Kenya is I had my collaborator Tim McClanahan had all this data on what had been happening in the tropical reef system over about 18 years. And so he had data on, on fish, on urchins, and on all the different benthic components of the ecosystem. And so I wanted to look at the relationship between crustose coral and algae and all these other species. And so going into this, we, ha we knew a few things and there were some things we didn't know. So we know that the predatory fish is, of course, going to eat some herbivores, probably also some predators, although that's not included here. We know that the herbivores preferentially consume um, fleshy algae. We know that fleshy algae competes with coralline. And we know that because of the fact that those herbivores are eating the fleshy algae, they're having this indirect positive effect on the coralline. But we don't know um, from any of the work that had been done in anywhere else in the tropics is actually is in very good detail what are the effects of the, the fish grazing and the urchin grazing on the coral in itself. So are there direct effects that we're not accounting for in this equation? And because we don't know that, we actually don't really know what's happening to the coral and indirectly when we start removing things like top predators. And then um, we, you know, we are presuming that there is this positive relationship between coral and some of the invertebrate settlers based on laboratory studies. Um, but we don't know how much competition for space with those other invertebrate settlers plays into the picture. And so I wanted to sort of look at this all in a model.
And so I used data from three protected sites, four fish sites, from a time frame ranging from 1987 through 2005. I looked at 11 families of fish with biomass data, nine species of urchin, and eight categories of substrate. So those would be things like sponges and fleshy algae, corals. Um, Coralin was the dependent uh, variable in, in my model. Now to look at all this data, I had to do what's called a principal components analysis, um, which basically reduces the data set and eliminates covariation. So what a principal component analysis does is if you take all these things, like all these different groups of fish and urchins and substrate, and you find that some of them are always going up together over time, some of them are always going down together over time, it will separate the ones that are going up and the ones that are going down opposite into these axes that are called principal components. And so to give you a picture of what this might look like, so for example, it comes out with these different axes that explain variation in the data. And so the first factor of my principal component analysis showed that basically almost all of the species of fish, and these are the family names here, but all the fish are in green, were loading opposite of the dominant species of sea urchin. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Because in marine protected areas, we have a lot of fish, and outside them, we have a lot of sea urchins. So since I combined data from fish in protected areas, if this didn't show up, I'd be in big trouble. But that kind of explains how the principal component analysis worked to reduce the data set. So I now have this one factor that accounts for fish and then sea urchin with a couple other things um, in there, like sand and another um, uh, algae halomita. And I had these other factors. So the next one was all the other species of sea urchins against nothing. So they're all tracking together. There's nothing that tracked opposite from them, but they're all just kind of going together. And then my third factor was really picking up on um, things that could potentially be competitors. And so, you know, fleshy and, and algae and turf algae are, are loading opposite of soft and hard corals, which again makes sense because these guys compete with one another. So as soft and hard coral go up, fleshy algae and turf go down and vice versa. And so I put these three factors along with time into my model with Crestos coral and algae as the dependent variable to see what would come out. And what came out very strongly was that factor three really wasn't significant at all. And so the competition doesn't seem to be driving this system. And the strongest thing in the model, and for time I'm not showing you the statistics, but I'm going to show you a graph of it, was really related to, um, to sea urchin and fish. Um, oh, sorry, there are the statistics, excellent. Um, and so, well, those are the partial residuals, which aren't, aren't really giving you the, the p-values. But you can see that for factor three, this is a very, very small explanatory value of, of 0 0.03. Um, and so the, the competition really isn't what we're looking at. And so what's more important is our changes over time and then what's happening in terms of sea urchins and fish, as I just said. Okay, so looking at factor one, what this graph is showing is on the x-axis, you actually have the factor scores. And so those are determined from the principal components analysis, but basically what it is is as you move in this direction, you're moving towards more and more sea urchins, and as you move in this direction, you're moving towards more and more fish. And what I have on the y-axis is the partial residuals for, for coral and, uh, crestose coral and algae. So after explaining the variation of all those other factors that were in the model, this is just the effect of this factor on crestose coral and algae. And I have two types of dots in this picture. I have black dots re re which represent um, data that came from fish sites and open circles which represent data that came from protected sites. So I want you to notice a couple of things. The first is, and so on the y-axis as you go up, the numbers aren't going to be really interpretable, but as you go up there's more and more crestose coral and algae. And so all of the protected areas are within this fish-dominated um, state, and they also have relatively high crestose coral and algae. And if you look at the fish areas, the interesting thing is, so they, they do have, tend to have more sea urchin domination, but they actually kind of overlap a little bit with the marine protected areas um, in terms of hitting some areas where you have, you know, you start picking up the fish again. Um, and the thing that was really interesting to me was that you have much more variation in, in the data within the fished areas. And so if you start putting regression lines on these, what you can see is that within fished areas, as you move from areas with more fish and few urchins towards areas with lots and lots of urchins, the cover of coralline goes way down. And interestingly, within the protected areas, as you move from areas with sort of lower numbers of fish to really, really high numbers of fish, coralline cover also goes down. But if you look at sort of the maximum amount that these herbivores can remove coralline from the system, so that would be over here or over here, what you see 
is that basically the effect of sea urchins appears to be much more dramatic in terms of removing coralline from the system than the effect of fishes. Um, so this is what this large long-term analysis that I did showed, is that basically it appears that fish and urchin are both negatively correlated with CCA cover, but that urchins are having a much greater impact. Okay, so that's great, but that's all a correlative analysis, and so, um, so to follow that up, I needed to actually take a look at this and look ex experimentally at what the direct impacts of fish and urchin grazing are on crestose coral and algae. So what I did is I took pieces of coral and algae and I actually killed half of them. So the white part here is, is coral and I have killed, it is dead, the pink is living coral and I cut a hacksaw line in between them so that I would have a way to measure growth back into the, the live section or erosion into the dead. So if the coralline were to grow, I could measure that distance, and if it were to die back further, I could measure that distance. So it gave me a discrete measuring point. And I put these pieces of coralline into three treatments. So I put them into fully caged treatments that excluded both types of grazers, so fish and urchins. I put them into open-topped open cages where fish could get in, but urchins could not. And I did view fish going in and grazing in these all the time. And then in completely open treatments where fish and urchins could access the system. And I put these in um, both a fished area and an adjacent protected area. And so again, the fish area is going to be really dominated by sea urchins, protected area dominated by fishes. So what did I find? So if you look in the high fish site, which is a marine protected area, you can see that and by comparing the no grazing treatment with the fish only treatment, so this, and what's on this axis is the coralline cover change in millimeters per month, so how much it grew. And so you can see that fish actually did significantly reduce the growth rate of coralline. So that's exactly what I showed in my model. The interesting thing to me in the protected area is that there's so much fish predation that you can barely find a sea urchin, and yet we still picked up this also. If you look at the difference between only fish grazing and fish and sea urchin grazing, you can pick up the effect of urchins, and you can see that urchins also reduce the growth of coral and algae. Okay, so this is sort of confirming what I saw in my model, but here it looks like the effect of urchins isn't so high, but that's because we're in a site where there aren't a lot of urchins. So move into the, um, the high urchin site or the fish area and what you see is that there is no difference between the no grazing treatment and the fish only treatment in terms of coral and growth rate, but that when you look at the effect of urchins by putting them in a completely open environment, your growth rate actually goes down to close to zero. So coral and really just can't grow in those environments because of the grazing by sea urchins. Um, and so this was really great because it sort of, it sort of ex did a lot of explanation of what I was seeing in my correlative model and showed it um, experimentally in the field so that the, the coral and algae, again, is negatively impacted by both, but the grazing impact of urchins is much, much stronger. And so what that means in terms of management is that, you know, if we look at these management areas and we have biomass here in um, kilograms per hectare, and so in the protected areas in Kenya, you can see that we have pretty high fish biomass, really low sea urchin biomass. The transition is still going over recovering. That's that newer protected area. But the fished area, we have a complete outbreak of sea urchins. This is actually a really large problem. That is a huge number of, of sea urchin um, in terms of kilogram per hectare. And the fish actually go down to almost nothing. And then in correspondence with that, what we see again is this graph that I showed you before of declining coralline as you move from higher protection to lower protection. And if you actually look at who the players are, and so in this graph what I have is um, fish biomass over here, sea urchin biomass over here. The top graph is what's going on within fished reefs. Bottom graph is what's going on within protected reefs. And these are different families of um, fish and sea urchins. And so these guys over here are the herbivores, and so you can see, you know, basically the herbivores drop out with fishing. Also the predators drop out with fishing. The predators, which are right here, the ballistids and the labrids, actually had lower biomass to begin with than the herbivores. So it's really an herbivore-dominated um, system in terms of fish. But even though they're not common and they're not really targeted by the fishery, the incidental bycatch takes them down low enough, and in particular the ballistidae, which are the major, um, those are trigger fish, major ur urchin predators, account for this, this huge explosion of sea urchins that we see within fished areas. Okay, and I said all that, so we're going to move on. Okay. Um, so this whole analysis kind of illustrated um, some of the, the things that I didn't know before from this diagram. 
And so again, just to reiterate, the competition with substrate did not turn out to be very important. What we found is that the fish and the urchin both had negative impacts on the coralline. Those are the solid lines, but the strength of the impact of sea urchin was much stronger than that of fishes. And so that allowed us to sort of understand how fishing was indirectly um, affecting this algae species. Okay, so it's an algae. Who really cares? Well, that was a question a lot of people were asking me. Now, I care, <laughs> and it's pretty. You know, it's pink. We've got some pink cupcakes. They're delightful. But <laughs> if you go to the general world, you say, oh, man, you're losing your algae. You know, they really just don't care. And so I had to connect this back to corals. Oh, and I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I go to the lovely world of corals, let me spend just a little more time on algae. So if we look at, uh, the, at just comparing the Caribbean and Kenya, so why was this so novel? Because in the Caribbean, hey, we used to have urchins, and so why, why didn't people pick up on this? And why was it so surprising that sea urchins were grazing away all of the coralline in Kenya? And actually, I think that the, historically, the Caribbean probably looked quite a bit um, more like Kenya. In fact, I'm working on a meta-analysis of this right now to look at historic and current densities of diadema antelarum populations within the Caribbean in relation to bioerosion, coral cover, coral and cover fleshy algae, and then um, fish predators of the sea urchins. Um, and before the urchin disease, and this, there were some areas in the, in the Caribbean that had greater than 70 um, urchins per meter squared, and they did negatively impact coral. And now I have to say that this is kind of an anomalous result. So most areas in the Caribbean did not have 70 urchins per meter squared, but there were a lot of them that had 20. And in the course of doing this meta-analysis that I'm doing, it looks like around 12 to 14, urchins stop having the positive effect of removing the algae and start actually eroding the substrate. And so there were a lot of places in the Caribbean where we might have seen this, the same types of trends that we were seeing within Kenya. And so in terms of coralline, you get the same, the same graph, but for very, very different reasons, and it's because of the absence of these sea urchins. And so all of this, you know, is, is not really rocket science. It basically says that intermediate disturbance is good. Um, so if you have, um, if you look at sort of a gradient of grazing intensity, if you have really high grazing intensity, and that would be the amount of sea urchins that we have on Kenyan fish reefs, you lose your coralline. In Caribbean fish reefs where you have absolutely no grazers, you also lose your coralline. And so an ideal situation is where you have some intermediate amount of grazing intensity that allows the coralline to flourish and then hopefully has these linkages with the rest of the ecosystems and things like corals, which I think I can now segue into. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so having done all this work on coralline abundance, I wanted to see how this linked up with actually, actually coral recruitment. So do the corals care if you start changing the coralline around? And so we know that some crestose corallines induce larval settlement of some corals. And so here we have um, a very nice patch of coralline on one of my settlement tiles. And circled is a very newly settled little coral spat right smack on the middle of that coralline. That is great. But some um, corallines are actually quite bad for settlers. And so here we have coralline overgrowing a newly settled coral. And in some cases, coralline actually do this um, epithelial sloughing, so they remove the top cell layers to get off fouling things like um, turf algae that might settle on them. So if you're a coral and you can't move and you land on something that's going to be pushing off its top cell layers, that's actually not such a good place to be. Um, and we know from the literature from a lot of work from Bob Stenick that fish and sea urchins can promote different species of coralline. And so I wanted to look at this dynamic um, in Kenya and ask, is the species composition of coralline different and protected in fish reefs? And then again, does it matter for the corals? And so what I did is we painstakingly looked at about 2,500 specimens of coralline um, from Kenya from uh, seven different sites. We found 11 coralline taxa. Um, and of those, coralline identification is notoriously difficult. And so we were using morphological characteristics to do this. Um, and so what I did with my field partner is we sat um, in an area with a lot of mosquitoes in a handheld microscope and looked at the reproductive structures, which are the conceptacles, and used those to group corallines into these, um, into these groups that we thought were the same. It turns out we accurately um, ca characterized five groups of corallines. We sent subsamples to a taxonomist who clarified for us. Um, and from those groups, the five groups for which we were able to accurately characterize the coralline, we found one that is inductive, so has a chemical that is known to attract invertebrate settlers, two that are not only non-inductive but also thought to be harmful to coral settlers, and two for which we don't know the relationship at all. And those five um, groups of coralline accounted for 57% of the total coralline cover, so it was actually a pretty good amount of what we were looking at in terms of the substrate. <coughs> 
So here's what we found. Um, Coraline cover is on the y-axis, and then I have these different species. In one case, we grouped two species into an inductive genus. Um, protected are white bars, fished are gray bars, and you can see that in general, um, there were more corallins within the MPA overall. Um, what I was mainly interested in, though, was this change to the inductive coralline hydrolithon. But I wanted to look overall at what the corals were doing with changes in all these different species. Um, and so do corals selectively settle on crestos coralline algae? And if they do, are they selective to the species or genus level of coralline algae? So we went out in the field and we looked at what juvenile corals had settled on relative to the availability of that habitat in the general substrate. So we said, okay, well, there's three things that corals can settle on. Bare substrate, so nothing. Turf-dominated substrate or coralline, and there's really nothing else because they can't land and survive on a sponge or on a bryzoan. So the other substrates are really not substrates, you know, live corals. They just can't live there. And then among the coralline, we had these five taxa. And so for each, what we'd do is we'd say, okay, so we have a coral that's seated, seated, uh, sorry, is situated right here on a little piece of coralline. That's great. What is the abundance of that coralline in the rest of the, the environment so that we can say, what is the likelihood that we would find this coral on that substrate by chance, or are you finding it on that substrate more than chance? Um, and so we surveyed the corals, and because we didn't want to do destructive surveying, we looked at the substrates touching the coral, so surrounding the coral, as opposed to actually digging up the coral and trying to get at what was underneath it. We just thought that was going to be a good proxy. Um, we tested this at three different scales, and we found the same patterns. Um, so I'm just going to present, in um, thinking of brevity, uh, the major results here. So what this graph is showing are the number of recruits on the y-axis, and then these are the three basic categories, and what I have in the white bars are observed. So this is the number of corals that we actually observed on a certain substrate compared to the expectation, and the expectation is based on how much of that substrate was present within the environment. So you can see that for coralline, we have way more corals on coralline substrate than we would expect by random chance. For bear, we have less corallines than we would expect um, on bear than, than its prevalence in the habitat, and then the same for turf. So it's, it's um, one of the first field studies that's actually gone out and said, do we find this in the field? Yeah, we know they like it in the lab, but do they actually show these preferences within the field? And the answer seems to be yes. And then we went in and we looked at the different types of coralline. And so this is the exact same type of graph. And again, this, this hydrolithon is the inductive. Um, it's two species within a genus, and we tend to find more um, coral recruits on that than we would expect by chance alone. We tend to find less coral recruits than we'd expect on these two non-inductive species. So we know from laboratory studies that those are non-inductive and actually harmful. And then it looks like here that there's a trend for one of the species which we have no idea of the relationship that it may actually have some inductive properties. And so again, less preference for the non-inductive, more preference for the inductive and a possible candidate. And we looked at this across different coral families, because different families are supposed to possibly act differently, and we found um, the exact same results across families that have very strong preferences for corallins and, and families like Pasolapora that are considered to be much more weedy. And in general, they all showed this, this basic trend, which is very interesting. Um, and we tested over different size classes, and we also found the same trend. So whether I looked at corals that were under 5 millimeters or corals that were up to 30 millimeters, which is probably about a year old, I found the same exact trends. And so then I did a model to look at, um, so if I look at um, the, um, the cover of coralline um, and the cover of inductive coralline, um, and I, um, you know, and, and we know that this is, sorry, this is what's happening with management. So in the, oh, I'm sorry, this is one thing I didn't explain, is that in Kenya, in addition to the, um, the long-term protected areas and the newer protected areas, they also have these areas called gear restricted areas that are right next to the protected areas, and they're supposed to have these gear restrictions in place and kind of be a buffer. The gear restrictions aren't very well monitored, and, and the, um, the gear restricted areas haven't really been abundantly surveyed. So one thing I was looking at was also, 
I was worried that maybe the MPAs were protected because they were nice spots, and so everything I was finding was because these were just good spots. So I thought I'd better go into these gear-restricted habitats, which were right next to them, and had sort of minimal management and see what I found. And so what I found was, in terms of coral and percent cover, again, much more in the closed area, no significant difference between open access and these adjacent gear-restricted areas. And these are really very, very identical sites in terms of what their, um, their environmental parameters look like. And in recruit densities, you see the exact opposite pattern. So you see a lot enclosed, no difference between gear restricted and open access. And, um, and I did a model and I found a very strong correlation between the inductive uh, coral and hydrolithon and the recruit density, even after accounting for the effect of, of sea urchins on possibly removing the recruits themselves while they're removing the coral. Okay. Um, so. Basically, looking at this whole schematic and in the very end focusing on, you know, the links between coral and corals, we find this strong relationship across multiple coral families. It's still important after one year, so post-settlement mortality doesn't seem to modify, and I got at that by looking at the age classes. And recruitment should be affected by management over large spatial scales, and so I did this study on the scale of a nation and found these very strong results. And so in the last little bit of my talk, I'd like to talk just briefly about what I'm doing in California. So I'm now looking at coralline in California and settlement dynamics of California invertebrates. And um, instead of looking at the impacts of fishing, in, in particular in, in Central California, it's very hard to do that with the corallines and the urchins because of the lovely sea otters, which <laughs> really changed the dynamics. So whether or not you're in an MPA, you likely have uh, sea otters, and they're, and they're taking out the urchins. So that would not be a viable question here in the Central Coast. But I'm very, very interested, because coralline is calcifying in, in, in terms of what's going to happen as we have different ocean acidification scenarios. And is this going to make a difference in terms of our commercial fishery and how well these invertebrates are able to recruit to coralline environments? Um, so this is this new project that I've started at Hopkins Marine Station. I'm working in northern and central California and asking these two basic questions. And the first one is, what the heck uh, corallines do we have in California? because we don't actually know who the crustose corals are subtitally. We know okay for the inner title, but not at all for the subtitle. It's really a black box. And so of those corals, are there some that induce settlement? And then if there are, will cli climate change be predicted to alter these sediment, uh, these settlement dynamics? And so why might I think that climate change would alter settlement dynamics? Well, there's been a number of papers from the tropics that shows that ocean acidification reduces coral recruitment by changing this chemical signature. And so from this paper, they found that elevated carbon dioxide reduces the coral and cover, coral settlement, and it was actually most deleterious. Um, its most deleterious effect was to crustose coral and algae that had the chemical that um, caused larvae to settle. And so that's very, very interesting. And so that makes me concerned for California. So I'm going to just sort of briefly fly through methods. So first I had to determine the abundance and distribution of major coral and algae species. So I surveyed um, reef coralline in northern and central California and also coralline on cobble habitats because these could potentially have very different types of coralline. So we used transects and then we collected these, these lots and lots of cobbles from various sites. Um, we're using both morphological and genetic techniques to identify these corallines. Um, we're looking at invertebrate settlement preferences. So we're using abalone as a model system within the laboratory, but we're also doing community assays of what we find settled on these cobbles in the field. And so um, I have a couple of interns who are going through and we've rinsed all the newly settled invertebrates off of cobbles that we picked up in the field and they're sorting those. Um, and then I'm, because I was able to do these um, abalone settlement preference tests in the lab, I'm then subjecting the, the different types of coral to three ocean acidification scenarios and asking if this changes abalone settlement dynamics. And so this is just a schematic of where I've been able to sample. And so um, I did one site up in Mendocino County. I was able to do four sites in Sonoma and three sites in the Monterey Bay. Interestingly, um, the coral and cover is, is very consistent. It's always um, around 30%, and that's sort of moving algae and looking for it, so it's a dominant player in this ecosystem. I have about 400 samples from the reef, 120 from cobbles, and I think there's about eight really common groups of coral that are showing up again in these surveys. And so in terms of abalone settlement, um, basically what I did is I put little chunks of coral in vials. I had different types of corallines. I don't actually know what they are yet. I'm waiting for the genetic results, so I've just given them code names based on my groupings. And I had a control. And so if you look at this, 
one of my species of corallin actually really, really enhanced settlement. So do abalone settlement without a uh, settle, without any corallin at all. They do at about a 20% rate. And the most, the inductive um, species that I found in, enhances settlement of abalone up to above 50%, which is pretty interesting. The even more interesting thing to me is that this species of corallin is incredibly rare. So it's not showing up a lot in my surveys. In fact, it's hard to find enough replicates of it to do these tests. And so that's really interesting. Um, and so um, what I have going on right now is I have all these little plastic vials um, with little pieces of corallin on them. I have them in these big bins with different pH treatments. So I'm looking at six, uh, six species. I have 10 replicates of each species, pH 7.9, 7.5, and 7.2. The corallins are going to sit there for about six weeks, and then I'm going to put 100 abalone larvae per, per vial. I'm going to do that in normal pH conditions so that I can decouple the effects of the acidity on the larvae from that which is affecting the algae. And then the other thing I'm working on, um, and this is in coordination with, with John Geller from Moss Landing, is that we're um, trying to develop this technique where we can take the information of these communities of invertebrates from the cobbles sequence the 20 most common organisms, use um, qPCR to try to calibrate the counts to what we're getting from, from using genetic techniques, um, from looking at what's in these communities, and then do some of the samples with a metagenomic approach so that we could develop a rapid monitoring tool over time to look at who's coming in when and on what kind of substrate. And so I know you can't really read these, but these are, these are the results of different, different types of organisms we found on 30 cobbles. Um, and so we're getting a lot of bivalves. We have a few barnacle cyprids, not too much. A lot of polychaetes, fairly high number of, of gastropods of, of different, different types. And so, you know, over time, we're going to be able to see if we're able to take these common things and develop some genetic tools where we can rapidly assay them. And so really quickly, implications. There have been very few studies on coral and ecology, and I think that's really a shame because it's very ecologically important. A lot of people monitor coral and cover, but not necessarily species. And so one of the things I'm doing with my, um, my sorting of the corallins morphologically and genetic work is trying to figure out, are there any of these that you can tell apart in the field? And if so, what, are the, the, what can people look for? And knowing the species is important because some corallins do have this inductive chemicals and others are very poor settlement substrate. Um, Species-specific relationships between corallins and invertebrates have been proposed. But there's really no comprehensive coral and surveys to put this in context. So for example, the Morses back in the 80s from UC Santa Barbara did a lot of settlement tests with abalone and corallins, but they just sort of ad hoc chose corallins mainly out of the inner tidal, and we didn't know how broad spread those corallins were, so you can't really put that work into context. And there's virtually no field validation studies, and so I have an intern who's putting actually species-specific um, little boxes of corallins out in the field, and we're going to see if who settles on each species is different. So we're starting to do some field validation tests. Um, and then species composition of corallin can be affected by anthropogenic factors like management, fishing and MPAs, and clearly oceanic changes. And I think there will be consequences for the settlement of invertebrates. And as climate change and marine um, exploitation both accelerate, I think the sustainability of some of these invertebrate fisheries or invertebrate habitats like corals are really going to depend on synergistic or additive effects of the interactions between fishing and acidification. And so with that, I'd like to close. I have a lot of uh, people for, to thank and funding sources to thank for my work in Kenya, and I think I pretty much felt like that. But I was very fortunate in getting a lot of support. And for my more, more recent work in California, um, I have the support of a lot of different organizations and a lot of faculty, including people like John Geller from here at Moss Landing Marine Labs and some Moss Landing Marine Lab students. And in terms of students, I'd just like to point out that I'm very proud to have a wide variety of schools represented in the group of students working with me, including a, a number of students from Monterey Peninsula College, one of whom is here today, who are doing an excellent job. And uh, to end on a little bit of humorous uh, note, I thought my work in Kenya was hard. I had to ride a camel with my quadrat to my field site. But you know, in California, I just have too much gear. So, <laughs> and I'd be happy to take any questions.
Yeah. Yeah. So, so my understanding is no. And I think that these are evolutionary relationships. And so it's a really interesting question. So why would a coralline, in fact, want things to land on that? And I think evolutionarily, the answer is, is probably that corallines, if, if you're not a coralline that's going to do this cell sloughing and get rid of stuff, you need somebody to come in and graze you because you need to get rid of the epiphytes. And so the ones that tend to have the inductive chemical are the ones that don't remove the top cell layers. And then things like corals have just picked up on that. And so they're queuing in on that. But really, it would be like the limpets, the chitons, and the abalone that the coralline would want to come in and, and graze on it. And so no, they can't morph from one form to the other. It, it does seem to be species specific. There is some evidence that biofilms on top of corallines can also have inductive um, features. But it, it also seems to be species specific. So it seems like corallines, whether or not it's within the coralline itself or in the biofilm, it still is determined by the species. And I'm not getting to that like detailed chemical level in my analyses, but it's a really, really great question. Yeah, so I don't know the answer to that. So I didn't actually do the previous study in the tropics with the corals and the corallines. So that's just, that's just literature that I've read. It's a really, really good question, and, and I don't know the answer. And so the first thing I'm doing is basically we're just testing. So do we expect ocean acidification to change the signal provided by these, these corallines to the larvae? And if it does, then I think those would be great you know, further steps to get into. Is it, is it something about the algae itself? Is it the chemical? And then at some point, you know, also put the larvae in the acidified scenarios too to see how that changes things as well. But I haven't, I haven't done that yet. Really good question. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Coral cover is, um, is in, in the fish reefs is, is quite low. It, it ranges between 2 and 10% protected reefs, it's typically between 25 and 35 percent. Coral cover, not coral in. All right. Oh, it, oh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, it, it, and it is really interesting. So, in general, a kind of metromathiae is the most abundant urchin, although the thing is I actually don't think that that is the one that's impacting the coralline because the kind of metro tends, it's this rock boring urchin and it actually bores little holes and it sits there and it really doesn't move. So what I was seeing much more impacts from was Diadema savinii, which is a, you know, a genus level relative of Antillarum from the Caribbean. And it's much, it's a much larger urchin, you know, in terms of its biomass and it's much, much more mobile and better protected. And so it tends to move around and that's what I kept seeing grazing the corallines. In this experiment and some other work I looked at, I did with the effects of, of grazers on coral recruits themselves. Yeah. All right, thank you.